we have been looking at the early church and looking, first of all, at the development of, of two individuals, basically, Peter and Saul. And as we have gotten into uh, the middle part of, of the book of Acts, we begin to see how that their effect upon the church uh, has, uh, is reflected. Uh, the sidelights that we're going to talk about are conclusions about the Holy Spirit and the name Christian, uh, which is very important uh, because oftentimes uh, uh, people, uh, even scholars, uh, have said, well, this was not a, uh, a, a blessing name, this, this was a name of curse. And I disagree with that. The spotlight in this particular chapter is going to be answering to our brethren. Uh, just as in a, in a regular family, uh, in, order in order to have peace in that family, there has to be interaction with the brothers and the sisters. Uh, sometimes it's it's pretty good, and sometimes it's not so good. Uh, I had one fellow one time that was having a lot of problems with his brother, and, and he said, the brothers are supposed to fight. I said, well, not necessarily. I said, you can have verbal fights and uh, agreements. But to uh, punch each, each other out is probably not the best thing to do. Nobody, said, nobody really wins in that. Uh, we, have, we have to remember that we have, that we a, have responsibility a responsibility to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Whether we, Whether we like to admit it or not, or not there is somebody, there is somebody who is always, always watching, watching us. us. And, and those, those little folks, little folks uh, are, are, are pretty sharp. Pretty sharp. Uh, I have a great, have a great grandson. He's, he's going on going by. He's, 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 he's almost on by five, five, going on going on twenty one. And, and uh, uh, he doesn't miss this thing. thing. Uh, he knows, he knows where things are in our, our house. house. We may we see, may see him, him twice, twice, maybe three maybe times, three times a year, year. But he knows, he knows where things where belong. Things belong. Uh, because, because he goes to them, to them, and he says, he says well, where is, where is such, it's not where he is, where he is. And, and so we so have to, we have to uh, uh, help him find it, find it, or, or put it back put it where it was. Uh, uh, somebody's, somebody's watching, you. watching you. Somebody's, somebody's following you. Somebody's, you. somebody's, somebody's imitating, imitating you. Some of the highlights, the highlights that we look at in this particular chapter are the concerns about the Gentiles. Peter's review and explanation of him preaching to them and converting them. Uh, the good uh, news, the news uh, uh, goes to Antioch. Antioch. Barnabas, Barnabas and Saul, and Saul go to Antioch. And Agabus, Agabus prophesies a tremendous famine that went throughout all the world. And we'll read about that from an outside source. In the 11th chapter, it begins with these words. The apostles and the brethren that were in Judea heard about that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come back to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. Uh, he goes and he preaches. Uh, we talked about Cornelius and his conversion and his household. And the word gets back to Jerusalem before Peter gets back. Now that's kind of, in our day and time, when something happens within seconds, within certainly within minutes, we usually know it because somebody's on their phone, they've texted us and said, did you know, or this has happened, and uh, th this is the way that happens. Uh, sometimes the news comes across before it actually happens. That today that's called false news, uh, and sometimes they have to go back and correct themselves because they didn't get it right to start with. But the word gets back to Jerusalem, and when Peter comes, there is a a group that is ready to jump him. And these contentious people were either Jewish Christians or of the Jewish opposition to the way. Now, the problem was that he went and he ate with Gentiles. Uh, I sort of believe that, that this was uh, the, the problem arose specifically from 
the Jewish Christians. Uh, I doubt that the Jewish opposition had an awful lot to, to know what was going on with Peter at this particular time. Their complaint was he had eaten with Gentiles. Uh, did you, anybody ever suggest to you a restaurant that you had been to and had a bad experience? And they said, oh, you need to go try whatever restaurant this is. And you said, yeah, I've been there. I've been there. Uh, we had a little problem Sunday when we ate out. Uh, part of Judy's food was not thoroughly cooked. And she wasn't going to say anything about it. And I, when the waitress came, I said, look at this. I said, this is, this is not well done. And the girl just had a conniption. And I think you're not, you might ought to do it more often to point out that your food's not exactly right. Because what happened is that she went back to, to the uh, kitchen. They remade what wasn't cooked well. And then she gave me a $10 gift card. So I'm going to complain more often. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's what it was or not. But anyway, uh, I had, I think what it is, I, the manager comes and sits down and visits with us every time that we go in there. And I mentioned to her that my birthday was, was Saturday, this coming Saturday. I think that's where that came from, really. So the third thing says, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Now, this problem of circumcision and uncircumcision is, is hard for us to comprehend. Uh, this was the sign as far as the Jews were concerned. But it's kind of interesting to note uh, historically that the Jews were not the only ones that practiced circumcision. The Egyptians practiced cir circumcision. And so other, other nations had practiced circumcision also. And so as a, as a result, this was not such a specific thing as far as the Jews were concerned, but it was uh, to them, uh, as God had given it to them, a sign of the covenant that was made with, with Abraham. So to them, anybody that was the uncircumcised, which was in, in general, Gentiles, the unclean. Uh, this was the problem that they had with Peter. You were with uncircumcised men. You ate with them. Uh, you put down red carpet. Your lights are dim. That's Ill, that you shouldn't be able to dim lights in and elders have heard these, and preachers have heard these complaints uh, for years. Uh, were these pews always padded? Anybody been here that long? Yes. Always? They were both padded. Bad padded. You avoided one conflict there, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. Well, that was back when the preacher preached a long time. Because <laughs> I know who was preaching. <laughs> so uh, you, the, the people complain about the songbook that you have. They complain about who leads singing. They preach how long the preacher preaches. Uh, there are all types of complaints that come along. And the people that make these complaints, they're legitimate to them because they think that they know better than, than the other folks. This would tend to show how that so many thought of the early disciples of being only a sect of the rest of Judaism. Otherwise, what the disciples did would have no concern to the Jewish folks, the circumcised people. And this also raises a question of division within the early church of the Judaizing teachers, those who taught that one must first become a Jew and practice things of the old law like circumcision before one could be a good Christian. Uh, by the time we get to the 15th chapter, this is a full-blown thing of the difference between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. 
And there's a big conference that takes place in Jerusalem and decisions have to be made about what to do and how to get along. And I think this might well explain Paul's actions later on when he takes Timothy to be circumcised. And this is recorded in Acts 16 verses 1 through 3. Paul went to Derbe and to Lystra and there he found a disciple named Timothy. Uh, this is this is interesting that he finds a disciple. He's the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but the father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the believers in Lystra and Iconium. And Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and had him circumcised because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So uh, this is just one of those things that uh, was that had uh, that would have made a tremendous effect upon uh, the effectiveness of, of Timothy and, and Paul in, in their preaching. One that Paul was still observing uh, much of the old law, and two that Timothy uh, would need to go places with Paul, where if he were not circumcised, then he would not be accepted. Uh, Paul continued to observe the feast in Jerusalem. Acts 21, 21, they had been told about you that you teach all the Jews living among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, and you tell them not to circumcise their children or observe the customs. Rumors, half-truths, uh, falsehoods uh, come to us from, from all kinds of, uh, of directions. And we have to be very careful that we don't jump to conclusions, which uh, whether you understand baseball is not America's most favorite game, jumping to conclusions is. What then is there to be done? They will certainly hear that you've come, and so do what we tell you. We have four men that are under a vow. Join to these men, go through the rite of purification with them, pay for the shaving of their heads, and thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself observe and guard the law. But as for the Gentiles who have become believers, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what was been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what is strangled, and from fornication. And Paul took the men the next day, having purified himself, he entered the temple with them, making public the completion of the days of purification, when the sacrifice would be made for each one of them. Paul continued to observe the law of, of Moses. In most instances, uh, you have to remember Paul's background being a Jew. It's sort of like uh, being a Southerner and not being able to, to, and to quit speaking with a twang. You just can't, can't get away from it. Uh, I remember when I f first went to Lipscomb, uh, we had uh, some kids from Yankee Land, and they would call us into their rooms and say, I want you to talk to us. Just, 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 just talk to us. You know, and it's sort of like the kids from Florida and the first time that they saw snow. They, they were like a dog turned loose in the snow. You know how you turn your dog loose and the dog, mm, runs through the snow and jumps and carries on. These kids were like that. And, and you have to remember that, that the circumstance sometimes dictates what is said and what is done. And so you have to, you have to be careful about this. In verse 4, the Bible says that Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa, and I was praying. And in a trance, I saw a vision. It was something like a large sheet that came down from heaven, being lowered by, by its four corners. And it came close to me. And I looked at it closely, and I saw four-footed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. 
And I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice came from heaven. What God has made clean you must not call profane. And this happened three times, and then everything was pulled up again to heaven. So Peter explains what happened to him prior to going up to uh, see Cornelius. And it, he says, and at that very moment, just as soon as this one's up, somebody knocks on the door. Three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were, and the Spirit told me to go with them and not make a distinction between them and us. Now the them is Gentiles, and us are the Jews, or Jewish Christians. These six brothers also accompanied me. So Peter takes six people with him from Joppa to, to uh, Caesarea. Then he comes back to Jerusalem, and the same six are there with him. These are men to verify the very thing that they had seen and what had happened. And that Peter just wasn't teaching a, a preacher's story. He told us how that he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon his call. Peter, he'll give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. There's the men inquiring where uh, Simon is, uh, Simon Peter is at the house of Simon the Tanner. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon us at the beginning. You could have heard a feather hit the floor when he made this comment. The beginning that Peter refers to is the beginning of the church in Acts, the second chapter. The falling of the Holy Spirit that happened on that particular day. Uh, he does not refer to the fact of tongues of fire, but he refers to the general event of what took place, the coming of the Holy Spirit upon them. Uh, this would have been the apostles, uh, whoever painted that picture, uh, I thought did a pretty good job. He says, And I remembered the word of the Lord, of how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, as things go on, oftentimes we are reminded of things that happened to us in the past. And you would think that something as significant as the coming of the Holy Spirit upon, the, upon the, the brethren on the day of Pentecost would not be something that would be forgotten or what Jesus had said about being baptized with the Holy Spirit. I believe if Jesus had told me that and then later on within uh, a, a year's period of time that the event actually took place, I don't think I'd have had any trouble forgetting it. Verse 17, he continues by saying, If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? And when they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has, give, has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Peter recognized God's power in providing the gospel even to the Gentiles. He brings the message back, and the brethren at Jerusalem accept this as a fact also. This is, this is earth shattering for the Jews. Their concept and what they had been taught for hundreds of years was they were the chosen ones that uh, they were basically they were the only ones going to go to heaven, uh, that God didn't uh, look upon the Gentiles like he did upon, upon them. And, and yet this is not what their scripture says. When you go through the Old Testament and you look at all of the 
Gentile individuals that God used or blessed, uh, it's amazing. But the message was given to Abraham in, in Genesis, the 12th chapter, when he says, through you all families will be blessed. Not just your family, not just your descendants who later became the nation called the Jewish nation, but all families. And, and going back to Abraham was, was their focal point. God made a covenant with Abraham. We are the children of Abraham. And yet they still missed the point that God had made many years before. In Ephesians 2 and verse 11, Paul writes, So then remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision, by those that are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, remember that you at that time were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Made family. For he is our peace in his flesh. He has made both groups into one. He has broken down the dividing wall, that is the hostility that's between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new huma humanity in place of two, thus making peace. This is a statement that fired the Jews. It set them on fire to say that God had abolished the law with its ordinances and commandments. They could not understand that. It appears to me that there were two choices that were made when, when Christ came. One, if you were a Jew, you could become a Christian, but you could still observe the law and that this was just part of your heritage. Uh, we, we forget that, that Judaism was not just religion. Judaism was their civil law. Judaism was their religion. Judaism told them what they could eat and what they couldn't eat told them uh, if they had to go to the bathroom where to go and what to do with it. Uh, and this was all for God to purify a people, to get them ready for what we know today as Christianity, in which we are purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, the sacrifice system that was used under the old law uh, has been argued whether or not that it removed sin or just commuted sin. And some have explained it as that every year when the sacrifice was made by the high priest, that those sins were not forgiven, but simply rolled forward. Uh, it's sort of like having a balloon note at the bank. There is a due date, and when it comes due, the bank can do one of two things. They can either demand payment, full or partial, and they can roll it forward, saying, okay, you don't have to pay anything except the interest now, and this will come due in six months like it did before. Uh, that may have been the way that the sins of the, old, uh, of the people under the law of Moses were taken care of. There are passages that seem to indicate that their sins had been remitted or taken away. But that's, that's a whole different study that not, we don't need to get into tonight. And the whole purpose of this is that he might reconcile both groups, Jew and Gentile, to God in one body through the cross, putting to death that hostility through it. 
the cross was more than just taking away sin. It was to unite people in Jesus Christ. So he came and he proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those that were near. Those that are near the Jews, those that are far off the Gentiles. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father, to God. So then that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also the members of the household of God. Built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place of God. You are the temple of God. That is hard for us to comprehend. We are sort of like David and Solomon. We want to build great edifices for God uh, all throughout this town. Uh, there are buildings that have been built. And it's obvious that some of them were built to try to outdo others. Uh, we drove by the chapel on the hill uh, yesterday. <coughs> and Judy made the comment. She says, it's, it's such a, a small place. And I said, yeah, it's a standard uh, military chapel. And I said, they found out, just like they found out that the town wasn't big enough for to all the people that had to come in here, they found out that the chapel on the hill wasn't big enough to take care of the religious groups that were here. And very quickly, uh, some of the larger groups started meeting in some of the gymnasiums of the, of the, high, the schools that were around about, which also happened with the Church of Christ in, in town too. When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, God has given even to the Gentiles a repentance that leads to life. Now those that were scattered because of persecution that took place over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and they spoke the word to no one except Jews. But among them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also. The Hellenists are the Greeks or the Gentiles. Uh, they're called Hellenists because of Helen of Troy. And so they go to Antioch and they preach about Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number became believers and turned to the Lord. And news of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Now, this map kind of shows the dispersion of these people as they left uh, Jerusalem. Uh, at the, the time of the persecution of, of Stephen. There were some that went toward Egypt. Uh, those from Cyrene probably went back home. Some of them went to Cyprus. Uh, some went from Jerusalem to Cyprus. Some went into Phoenicia, uh, which was the seacoast area uh, of today, uh, basically Syria, uh, and as far north as Antioch. Now, we have to remember now that there are two Antiochs that are spoken of in the scripture. Uh, there's Antioch of Syria and Antioch of Pisidia. And Antioch of Pisidia is, is up in the area of, of Asia Minor, uh, and Paul goes to that uh, later on. But there's a map to just kind of give you a rough idea of how that the word spread and moved out in different directions. When he came and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord and steadfast devotion, for he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. This is Barnabas. And a great many people were brought to the Lord. I don't know if that's Barnabas or not, but I thought it was a good picture. Then 
Barnabas goes from Antioch to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. And so it was for an entire year that they met with the church and they taught a great number of people. And it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. This should give us a clue into the character of Barnabas. Barnabas was a, was a peacemaker. And that's what we're supposed to be as children of God. A, we need to help people solve their problems, solve their differences. Uh, I, I preached at a place one time where I, I, the matriarch of the congregation uh, told me that she had, I, I had noticed her speaking very shortly, short not very friendly way to one of the ladies of the congregation. It was an older lady of the congregation. And I asked her about it. I said, do you have problems with her? And she says, yeah. She says, she came here from Macon, Georgia, and she never went forward and placed membership with us. She's just been here all these years. Uh, I thought as a Christian, I was a Christian wherever I went. And I thought whatever congregation that I was worshiping with, that I was part of that at the time that I was there. Paul seemed to think that when he would go to Jewish synagogues. He had a right as a Jew to be in the synagogue. But if they gave him an opportunity to speak, he told them about Jesus. And this was an opportunity. And this was a situation with Barnabas. He goes to Antioch. He sees the things that are going on. This is great. This is good. And the guy that can handle this and deal with this is Saul. So he goes on around to Tarsus. He finds Saul who is probably back in the family tent making business at this time. I cannot imagine Saul being quiet. I suspect that he was preaching and that there were, he had helped found a congregation in Tarsus. And Barnabas takes him and they go to Antioch and they were there. And this is the first time that the disciples were called Christians. They were called disciples up to this point. They were called members of the way, uh, the followers of Jesus. But this is the first time that they are actually called Christians. Now the question arises, who called the Christ disciples Christians. Possibly it was Paul and Barnabas. Some commentators allege that the name Christian is of heathen origin and is given in a derogatory manner of disciples, sort of like Christians, you know, with a hiss at the end of it. But we need to compare this with the promise that was made by God in Isaiah 62 and verse 2. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness. What? You mean the Gentiles are going to have a part? In Isaiah, 400, almost 500 years prior to all of this, says this is what's going to happen because he was inspired by God to say this. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness, all kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. My position is from this verse. I do not believe that it was a name of derision, but it was a name that God said, I'm going to give to you. It's not Jew. It's not Gentile. It is Christian because we are following Christ. And that's what the word Christian means, a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, there are some today that still hang on to this same idea that they believe that this was given in a, a derogatory way. Here's a picture. It's not good and clear, but it has the verse on it. And in those days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius 
Caesar. And that actually took place. Uh, here's a picture, uh, I mean a map of, of, the, of the Roman Empire, of all the areas that they had. Uh, the red parts are provinces that were added between A.D. 14 and A.D. 117. Uh, all the gold part was what was basically theirs to start with by A.D. 14. Uh, and this was going to be something that was going to be very widespread. Now, Agabus showed that there was going to be a great dearth or famine or drought in the whole world. Uh, I don't know if we can still blame this on Al Gore or not for global warming. If we can, it kind of disproves the whole idea. Because as, as life on earth cycles through, we have different things. I, I remember one year when the heat was unbearable. We were living in Sevierville. We had been to uh, the beach to camp uh, at Myrtle Beach. Uh, we were in trees. There was no breeze. It was terrible. And when we got home, the clock at the bank said 104 degrees. I sure was glad my air conditioning still worked. But it was terrible. Uh, about four years ago, we had a drought in our area. We were way under as far as the rain is concerned, but the last two years, we've had an abundance of rain. Uh, what did we end up with? 11 inches? 12 inches over uh, for the year. And it's a shame we didn't dam that up and, and save it because we may need it this summer. Who knows? But history shows that these cycles come through. Do you remember what happened in the time of Joseph? And why Joseph uh, was made in charge of all of, of the foodstuffs of, of Egypt? Because there was a great famine that took place. That's what brought his brothers down from Judea to Egypt because they heard that there was food down there. And they took it back home. Made two trips. Actually, they made three. The third trip's when the whole family moved down there. It came to happen in the days of Claudius Caesar. Claudius Caesar reigned from A.D. 41 to A.D. 54. So, this period that Agabus is talking about uh, is zeroed in because historically this is spoken of in books of history. During this period of history, different parts of the Roman Empire suffered much from famine. In A.D. 44 and 45, it was excuse me, particularly severe in Judea. This comes from Josephus in his Antiquities of the Jews, uh, section 20, uh, chapter 2 and section 5. And also uh, 25 and 2. Now, this is probably one of those things of Josephus you can accept as being right. You don't have to. Because there are a lot of things that Josephus says that are just really, really far out. But it happened. Verse 29, the, the disciples determined that according to their ability, each would send relief to the believers living in Judea. And this they did, sending it to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. They get together and make this decision. That's the end of chapter 11 of the book of Acts. Now, I need a couple of you fellows to come Help me with chapter 12. I got two different things to hand out.
Thank you, sir. Now, I'll go ahead and get started since we've still got about 10 minutes. Uh, well, they are passing out. Uh, one paper is, is the outline of the chapter and the questions for chapter 12. The other is, is, a, is a chart that I put together years ago on the family of Herod. And we'll talk about that just a little bit more when we get into chapter 12. Okay, the sidelights of chapter 12 deals with the love of the brethren and angels. The spotlight in this particular chapter is glorify God. I thought that's what we were here for. It is. The highlights include the persecution that is renewed, and you have to remember that the persecution of the church was sort of like the sun comes up, the sun goes down, the sun comes up, the sun goes down. And the persecution was a lot like that. Sometimes it was heavy and real harsh. At other times, thank you so very much. At other times, uh, it was not so much and not so big a deal. Uh, later on, we'll find Aquila and Priscilla had to leave Rome because of persecution of Christians there. And that's where Paul meets them. We'll talk about Peter being imprisoned. Talk about freedom from the Lord while the brethren were praying. And meanwhile, with Herod. Uh, Herod pops up a couple of times during this particular chapter. And we're going to talk about growth and service for the Lord. Chapter 12 starts with these words. About that time, King Herod laid violent hands. Just sit it right there. Be fine. Thank you upon those some who belong to the church. Notice this does not say all of those. It says some of those that belong to the church. Uh, he probably persecuted the church because it was politically advantageous. It is sort of like the politics that are right now being played out in Washington. Is the government open or is the government closed? Well, who's laid off? Quote, non-essential workers. If they're not essential, why are they hired to start with? Duh, you know. And the point of all of this is for our president to make a point, a uh, political point, and the opposition uh, with uh, Ms. Pelosi and uh, Mr. Schumer is a political point. And who hurts in all this? I'll tell you how to stop all of it. Now, I'm going to get off of my religious stump and get on politics here for just a moment. You know how to stop all of it? Stop the salaries of the senators and the representatives. They'll get it started. They'll get this over with. But you know they're still drawing their checks? Yeah, that's right. Don't worry about it. It won't make any difference in 100 years anyway. We won't be here. The question arises, which Herod is this one? Well, this is Herod Agrippa, the son of Aristobulus and the grandson of Herod the Great, the one who wanted to kill baby Jesus. Herod the Great is the one who wanted to kill baby Jesus. And this Herod was liberally educated at Rome and was extremely fond of show and popularity and pomp and circumstance. This is the one who strutted around all over the place with all of his great royal regalia. Uh, this is sub said to be a bust of Herod Agrippa. I'm not too sure but we can use it anyway. He's not here. It doesn't make an awful lot of difference. Uh, in the chart that you have, it is pretty much the same as this one. This is laid out a little bit different. Uh, they all came from a man by the name of Antipater. Antipater. He was the father of Herod the Great. And Herod the Great ruled from 37 B.C. to 4 B.C. He had four wives during that period of time. 
Uh, the first one was Mary Amney. He had a child by the name of Aristobulus, who was the father of Herod Agrippa I, the one that we're talking about this evening, and Herodias, the wife of Philip. And then she was, she was married to Antipatus. And then Herod Agrippa's son was Herod Agrippa II. And Herod Agrippa was the one that was married to Bernice and Drusilla. And it gets pretty complicated. It is interesting to note that there were three of the five sons of Herod the Great that, uh, I'm sorry, there were two of the sons of Herod the Great that never really ruled anywhere or anything. Herod Antipatus, Antipas or Archelaus and Herod Philip were a triumvirate and that meant that they all served at the same time or basically the same time. Uh, Herod Antipas ruled Galilee and Perea, Archelaus ruled Judea and Samaria, uh, and Herod Philip uh, ruled the regions north and west of Galilee. So uh, it was the Archelaus that was replaced by the Roman governors, Pilate, Felix, and Festus. And we'll run into those. We've already run into Pilate uh, who uh, was pr present at, at the sham trial of Jesus. We'll run into Felix and Festus a little bit later on. Uh, the daughter of Herod Philip was Salome. Uh, she was the, the daughter of Herodias, and she's the one that demanded the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Uh, that and five dollars will buy you a Starbucks. But that just gives you a rough idea of the political structure that was going on during all of this this time. This Herod had James the brother of John killed with the sword. Uh, I couldn't find anything that dealt with that. I found this one uh, that depicts the head of John the Baptist, probably done pretty much the same way. Uh, they would have chopped, probably chopped his head off that makes sure that there is, that they're gone. After this, he saw that that pleased the Jews. He proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the festival of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison. He handed him over to four squads of soldiers to, to guard him. If you're using the King James Version, it's quaternions, and intended to bring him out of the to the people after the Passover. That sounds a whole lot like the scene in, in front of Pilate with Jesus. What, how many men are in a quarter neon? Quarter neon. 16. Four soldiers for each of the four watches of the night, two were at the door, and two were chained to Peter. Verse 10, we'll see that. Intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, if your version says Easter, you need to go in there with your pen and, and scratch that out, and above it or below it, write Passover. Because Easter did not exist at that time. Easter is the observance of the resurrection of Jesus. And the Jews... We're not going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And that's what Easter was all about. The word Easter is a mistranslation. The word intended is Passover. Easter, or Eostre, was the goddess of love among the ancient Celts. Her festival occurred in April about the time of the Passover, which is about the time of the resurrection of Jesus. The Jews would not have been observing what today is commonly called Easter, which refers to the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, there would have been rioting in the streets and wholesale slaughter of Jews because of their rioting. While Peter was kept in prison, the church prayed fervently to God for him. 
the very night before Herod was going to bring him out, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers while guards were in front of the door keeping watch over the prison. Well, there are going to be several things that are going to take place at this particular time. Uh, yeah, you've got some questions you can answer if you want to get I, I, I think this is a good place to stop, and we'll take up in Chapter 12 uh, the next time at, at this particular point. Uh, we'll take up at verse 5 next time. Thank you for your very kind attention this evening. I appreciate it very much.